Well, I guess I will join, um, get started. And then uh, if I see people pop in, I'll, I'll add them to the conversation. Um, most of you uh, know very well at this point. Um, I'm State Representative Lori Stone. I represent District 28, which includes West Warren and Centerline. Um, I just want to uh, start off with a shout out. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, we need to work on destigmatizing mental health and access to health care for mm -hmm. mental health issues. Um, in light of the COVID um, situation, the Michigan government has opened a hotline for access, which is 888-733-7753. And uh, I'll try to throw it in the chat on the side. So if anybody wants it or sh wants to share it, um, help get that message out. It comes with a lot of anxiety and um, isolation can feel uh, very drastic. So we want our community to know that even though we are separate, um, we're supported. Um, like I said, my even though I'm working from home, from my lovely kitchen, um, it's been busy. 90% of my time has probably been around unemployment, uh, really helping community members navigate that system, which um, while they continue to improve it, it is a challenge at best. Um, as of now, uh, 1.3 million unemployment applications have been placed. Uh, 1.1 million have been processed and $4 billion have been paid out in the last eight weeks. So if you are one of the people who are waiting, um, it doesn't help you too much, but we're down to 200,000 or less pending. Um, 40,000 applicants were able to be cleared last week because of the governor pulled back another layer of um, that background fact finding to help expedite that. Um, if you are stuck in the phone periphery where uh, we just, you can't get a hold of anyone or can't get a hold through a chat or an email to the Unemployment Insurance Agency, please reach out to my office at L-O-R-I-S-T-O-N-E at house.mi.gov. Include in your email your name, uh, your phone number, an address, your claim number if you have it, and a short description of any um, dates and or findings. Then my staff or myself can uh, get that paperwork started and we'll follow back with any additional details we need. Um, we try to reach out within 24 hours or one business day so you can talk to a person uh, the UIA, because of their backlog, is asking for seven to 10 business days. Um, it's running about two weeks to um, get a follow up. You will get a call or they will process it and they will update your account online. Uh, and we are following back in my office on any of the tracking forms that we have followed or filed. Lord, before you move on to the next topic, are you going to type in the mental health line? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah because I'm, I'm waiting to copy that into my uh, Facebook page. That's I, I, I feel like I'm going nuts. Uh, I was <laughs> trying to get in. I got an oximeter, but it apparently came in damaged. Ooh. And I didn't know how to read it. I was getting a reading in the 50s, and Earl was saying, oh, so your fingernails are blue and you can't talk, right? And I, you know, I was busy communicating, so... It was the oximeter that was broken, but it, it sent me for a loop. Yeah, it's good, good that we have people in the community who can help kind of put that in perspective. It's a lot of information. Uh, yeah, and help publicize that. Make sure that, you know, we have this resource, make sure it's being um, reused. Mm -hmm. um, unemployment continues to put new um, support mechanisms they're implementing a new online filing form. So my office doesn't have to wait for them for an update. We can watch from the uh, database 
where you are in the queue, it, that's how it was described to us. So by the end of the week, uh, that should be updated and hopefully they've worked out bugs. Uh, they also have a new access for people with technical errors, uh, people who have forgotten passwords, locked out of accounts, transposed social security numbers. Um, we can uh, help connect you just through the technical so you don't have to wait through the adjudication line, which can be quite lengthy. Uh, just a heads up, if you are waiting for a phone call and you see an 866 number, please answer it. Um, they will make two attempts to contact you before putting you back at the bottom of the list. So keep an eye on that phone line. Um, if you are trying to call, the phone queues fill up for the whole day within minutes, first thing in the morning. So if you do not get into the queue first thing in the morning at 8 a.m., don't waste your time calling all day. It's not worth it. If you need a contact, reach out to my office. Uh, and we can help facilitate that for you. Um, if you if you are having problems with this process, continue to certify every two weeks with your eligibility. Because once they are able to clear that, you don't want them to have to go back and reopen your case for certifications that you are eligible to receive benefits, but you didn't apply for. Um, as the community opens, we are seeing that um, businesses are starting to open and ask workers to come back for shifts for hours. We're seeing manufacturing opening this week. And um, we have a lot of people asking, you know, if I can stay home and make more with unemployment, then go returning to a job that's open, which has potential exposure or other issues, what are my obligations? When will I get cut off? So the unemployment insurance agency is doing a program called WorkShare. They've used it for a while now and they're continuing it. So as you um, increase your hours, you can, unemployment will make up the difference between your unemployment benefits and your wages that you're receiving from your employer reach out to your human resources, your business owner, and make sure that they're familiar with WorkShare. Um, not everybody has utilized it. Not everybody has utilized um, unemployment in the recent past. So if you are returning to work and your earnings weekly are one and a half times what your state unemployment benefits would be. So between that 152 and 354 amount. So roughly around uh, $500 a week, um, you would not be eligible for benefits that week. So it, you can waive your benefits for that week knowing that you've made income and then you would still be eligible. So if you have 39 weeks of eligibility and you wanna maintain that eligibility waive the weeks that um, you've made that income and that week would then be tacked on to the end of your benefits. I thought that was a helpful tip. Um, you are eligible for underemployment as well and still getting unemployment benefits. So not enough hours or reduced wages you still are eligible for those benefits, continue to um, certify. And a lot of employees are concerned about what obligation do employers have to provide a healthy workplace? Um, you can imagine there's a lot of concern about transmission in the workspace. So um, in all employers are required to be in compliance with my OSHA, MI, OSHA. And they are expected to provide a safe workplace um, or a reasonable safe workplace. Yeah. So there are certain guidelines and there are certain, um, the, the governor in her safe start or smart start um, plan, that's part of the guidance businesses are given in order to reopen. Um, if you 
uh, cannot continue in safely in your work environment due to a pre-existing health reason, immunocompromised, you're responsible for primary your child care or as a caregiver for someone else, um, then you can still be eligible for unemployment benefits. Uh, make sure you're communicating that with your human resources and your employer. Uh, that's just an update. Any, I'll stop there. Any more questions on unemployment specifically? It is the hot topic of the hour. Seeing none, um, I'm going to continue on. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, I, I've heard also from several small businesses who are very concerned about uh, their ability to uh, continue to make a profit and uh, flourish under these circumstances. They're very concerned about what are the guidelines for reopening and uh, continuing to serve our community. Uh, I'm hosting a small business round table along with the Macomb County Democratic Legislative Delegation and Macomb County Chamber of Commerce. We're hosting a listening tour uh, Friday, May 15th at noon. It will be on a Zoom chat like this. And we, we wanna hear from business owners. You know, we have people in our community have qualified for the PPP uh, paycheck protection program. They received forgivable loans, but are very concerned that they won't be able to utilize them because they don't have the employees to help offset their paycheck. 75% of that loan has to go to provide for employee paychecks. Um, and just a lot of concerns about what are the expectations for you know, um, hygiene, for uh, sanitation, uh, and providing safe spaces for work, trying to reconfigure a lot of these businesses to be as open and able to serve as possible. So if you know any small business owners in the community, I have created a Facebook event for Friday. It is specifically for business owners um, and please encourage them to come participate. Next up, uh, you know, I have had opportunities to speak with the president of Macomb Community College this week, as well as um, some of our senior living uh, organizations. And I had the opportunity to attend a webinar on tracing, testing and tracing in order to open the community through Michigan State University. It was a fantastic uh, webinar with a lot of insights. Um, and some of the big takeaways were how our health departments, county health departments are going to help coordinate that. So we are really familiar with how we were asked to slow the spread you know, self-isolating and um, just restricting contact. And we were able to, um, what is that? Slow the curve, flatten the curve. And for a lot of people, that's what they grasped onto, flatten the curve. And now our numbers are coming down. Um, and then the health department jumps in with tracing. And it's important to understand what tracing looks like. So once a doctor's office, a hospital or testing center has identified someone who is COVID positive, they will have someone from the health department reach out to you, call you and do a health or a history with you of your probably last five to seven days of contacts. Um, and a contact is considered a contact with someone five, for five minutes or more at a space of six feet or closer. And that's where that social distancing comes in. And then they, you know, they're, they're, a lot of people think tracing is this new thing for COVID-19, but public health has done it for years, especially for STI, for tuberculosis, um, and other health issues that are communicable. So they have experience. Um, the, the thing is how widespread this is. So at a certain point when this started, you, you heard 
you know, if you were at this business between this time and this time, you might want to consider being tested. But at a certain point, it was so widespread, um, it, we couldn't narrow down where, it, where people were being exposed. Well, we're starting to reduce those contacts. And what they would do is, if you were identified as someone who was in close contact or someone who was at a, a location, oh. then they will then contact people within that circle. Um, to you know, ask if you have you're having symptoms, to have you watch for future symptoms, um, to advise you to get testing, um, and just reminder: this is what I learned is it takes three to five days for virus to accumulate in the system to the point it's testable. So even if I just had exposure today and I might want to go get tested tomorrow, um, even if I were exposed and developing coronavirus, um, I might not have a testable load in my system for three to five days. So there is this, this in-between time that uh, things develop. So. Lori, do you mind if I ask you a question? Jump right in. Okay. Um, I've heard, or I read somewhere rather, that um, the virus might move from your nasal cavity into your lungs and leave your nasal area so that a swab going there wouldn't find anything, but it could be well embedded in your lungs. Have you heard anything like that? So I will preface this with, I'm not a medical professional, right. um, but they did explain that there are a whole host of testing methods which include the na nasal pharyngeal swab, which is the one they stick up your nose and scrape your brain. Uh, um, yeah. There are, and now they're developing different variations on that that include saliva tests, um, nasal cavity, which are not so far up your nose. And there are uh, the, um, to a certain extent, the ability to test yourself. Um, saliva kit, nasal pharyngeal. Yeah, I think they covered them. Um, now they're still identifying how good these tests are. They have emergency um, usage that they could develop tests. Um, and so there are still some false positives. There are still some false negatives. Um, their uh, positive identifications are much higher quality and accuracy than their antibody testing, which is still in development. So a lot of people are going to see if they were exposed yet. Um, and so that they're still working on. Let's see. So we had a former Lieutenant Governor uh, Kelly, Brian Kelly on with us. And he really took this information and talked about how does this apply in our business realms? So, you know, one of the challenges is asking cu customers to wear a mask. And a lot of people are like, why am I wearing a mask? It doesn't protect me. Well, it stops spread and cross contamination. So we have employees who are risking exposure to be there, cash, cashiers, stack people. Um, and as customers, if they're doing us that, the least we can do is go in and wear a mask. It's not very comfortable. Um, well, that's more encouragement to get in, get what you need and get out. Um, but he did emphasize that businesses that are looking to reopen need to really look at four uh, risk mitigation processes. First is health screening. So when you ask employees to come back to work daily, they need to come up with a screening method that includes some aspect of um, asking about symptoms or have they experienced symptoms or exposure and daily temperature taking. Um, these are likely to be requirements, uh, but that hasn't been handed down officially. And then also the possibility of testing and screening from employers before you return to work. 
Uh, and I believe the understanding was employers are expected to provide that if it's required. So first one is keeping people who are not healthy or potential to spread people out of workplaces. Because if you're there with them six, eight, 10 or 12 hours a day, uh, we know that that increases transmission. So second is redesigning spaces and environments to accommodate social distancing. So they said, you know, uh, manufacturing spaces are very used to accommodating uh, OSHA guidelines and requirements for health and safety. Offices are not necessarily. So it's one thing is changing the environment, making sure spaces are distanced, you know, desks, um, contacts. Uh, the other part is changing the culture, you know, where you used to stop by someone's desk and say hi, or you go to the water cooler and hang out or grab lunch in a lunch room. So business owners and human resources need to be very thoughtful about how they're going to mitigate that potential for spread within environments. Um, and it's a change of in, uh, priorities. So on a um, uh, manufacturing line, the priority was how fast things could be you know, completed. Well, now it's less about how fast things can be completed and how observant and protective of you, you are of your employees. So we know that human resources are important Human capital are important. If you don't have employees there to do a task, your business isn't going to run. So that second piece was social distancing. The third piece is disinfection and sanitation. So um, we're used to having people who come in and clean a space overnight, um, but also looking at throughout the day, how do you keep surfaces cleaned? How do you keep shared spaces or tools or equipment clean? Um, and plans for that. Assume that someone in the environment could be a carrier or spreading and um, plan to mitigate that. The last piece is personal protective equipment. It was interesting that they said, you know, a lot of businesses think if I give you a mask and gloves, I have protected you. Um, and he said, personal protective equipment is most effective if the other three steps are in place. Personal protective equipment is that last piece of protection um, for uh, protecting your employees. So health screenings, social distancing, disinfection and sanitation, and personal protective equipment. So one of my pieces is going to be reaching out. Um, I've heard complaints from residents about, you know, why is the mayor enforcing these executive orders? Why are police writing tickets for not wearing masks? And, you know, whether you believe it, whether you believe it's a conspiracy, regardless, it's the law of the land until things change. We need to be respectful of those people who are stepping up to provide those essential services and work for us um, to protect each other. We don't want to be taking steps back now that we've made this progress. Any questions about that? No, I'd say coming from Brian Kelly, that actually sounds refreshingly reasonable. Kind of shocked, just like the well. Detroit News today. <laughs> I'm a little shocked today. <laughs> it is interesting, different positions, you know, uh, was pointed out to Detroit News, which is um, traditionally a very conservative news source, really um, stepped up to take the position that um, guns and intimidation do not have a role in the people's house where lawmaking is taking place. Um, and so, it's very interesting uh, where, where people are stacking up, lining up in positions they're taking. So that's my spiel. These are my big takeaways from what I've picked up this week. Um, but I just want to open the floor and say, well, 
what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What's your experiences? What's your concerns? And what are questions that I can take back to help? Um, I, I You might have already addressed this um, before I got on the Zoom, but with regard to unemployment, mm -hmm. um, I guess some info and also a question, because um, I will be contacting your office about my own unemployment claim. Um, I was able to actually to find out a lot of information today, ironically enough, by calling Michigan Works. And I don't know if that's being advertised, but Michigan Works, number one, is calling people back. And they gave me a direct fax line to be able to contact Lansing, the main Lansing hub. Uh, so for the first time in five and a half weeks, I actually was able to figure out what exactly was going on with my claim. They can't, they, they tell you they can't do anything about it. That's not in their bailiwick, but they can at least let you know what's going on through kind of the back door. So I don't know if that's something you want to, you think it's appropriate to pass along to others that are contacting your office if you haven't already. Um, yeah. But it was very, very effective. Um, yeah. So thank you. I took that note. I'm going to add it on. I, I did a little like five minute spiel on it. So I'm going to, um, Earl's going to repost this. And so I'll have you uh, circle back and watch that little section. But I'm, what I will do is do a little rundown about what happens. Um, once you are, you know, I've got people who are waiting four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and nine weeks to get something. And I said, it's due to the high volume. We're down to 200,000 claims of the 1.3 million out there. Um, and I really encourage people to reach out directly to my office because the, the uh, what I call the phone, um, you're just in purgatory. So um, our, in our, reaching out to state representatives, we can um, help be that advocate, that middle ground. We have people call and or email. We prefer email because we can get that information and start entering it. Um, and then we send off a tracking form to uh, UIA. It usually takes them seven to 10 business days, even with our intervention because of the caseloads. However, I'm seeing cases turn over very rapidly at this point, um, within a week. So um, reach out to us, provide your basic information, claim number, description of any of your um, problems and or findings. And then we, um, we, kind of, we contact them and we find out where you are in the queue and then they'll, they will contact you. So a lot of people want to call to make sure that they got your information and confirmation. Um, but in the end, they will contact you with the 866 number, answer it. They only call twice before they put you back at the bottom of the pile. So if they call and they, they send us a thing that says, we contacted your person this morning at 11 a.m. and we will contact them between one and three, I will, I've tried to call, email, and make sure that person knows they're calling back, be by your phone, because you don't want to be put back at the bottom of the list. Fair enough. Yes. Um, they are expediting things. They were able to clear another hurdle and clear another 40,000 of those, you know, what, 250,000 this weekend. So uh, we keep making progress. Um, and I went into more detail about um, as we're transitioning back to workplaces, um, like you said, Michigan Works is uh, opening things. There are places that are hiring and are in desperate need of workers. Um, and there is uh, transitional pay between that worker and your unemployment be benefits. So you're not walking away from, you know, Michigan benefits, pandemic uh, unemployment act benefits and it's dropping off. There's a, a work share that offsets that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, and reach out to me, George, if uh, I can be of any assistance. <clears throat> I will do, thank you. Yeah. And also help us get the word out in the community. Go ahead, Lori, un unmute. Okay, I unmuted. Uh, two things I wanted to chat about. One is, is there a chart or anything yet that the governor has put out that tells us when things are gonna start reopening. I, for one, I need to see two of my doctors. The one I need to see really badly, if you can see my pair of my glasses, no lens in one and a broken stem on the other, 
and I can't get an eye appointment yeah. um, because guy glasses are not considered essential. I consider it essential. Is there any information at all on when those are going to reopen? So she's already rolled back um, some of those things that are staff. Um, dentists, you can, you know, access and essential services. So a lot of those doctors are using telehealth, although that doesn't work if you need a, a lens. Um, but reach out to them and find out if they won't provide that service or open up for an appointment if they're referring to someone else in the community who will. Um, it's not a blanket, you know, none of these. They don't determine which services are essential or not essential. They're expanding hospital services. They're expanding surgical access. So really reaching out to your doctor and having that conversation with them and uh, request for access. And Lori. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, Lori, Lori, it's Diane Young. I just want to say that my doctor just emailed me today that they're now starting to take appointments again. So I think it was, um, I had several doctor clients who told me the reason they couldn't reopen is they didn't have PPE, but now their PPA e supplies are coming in. So they now are developing those systems. So I think Lori Stone's right that check with your doctor. And if not, ask around, we could probably get you a referral to a doctor that could see you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just um, wanted to address that. The governor is not going to give hard, fast dates on things. Uh, it's a, on a rolling basement basis. Um, it's incremental. If you've seen, I posted on Facebook, the six steps. So right now they're on low risk, um, outdoor, different things. So she goes on, she'll say it's data, not dates. But if there, you need okay. clarification on what's been, reach out to me. And if I don't know it, I'll ask our legal person. Thank you. Second, um, I don't know how many people are interested, but we're having an exciting week this week and next week with the budget hearings for the city of Warren. Last night, uh, it was brought to Sonia Buffett's attention, I think by Patrick Green, that several of the surrounding cities are now doing postage free ballots, which means the people will no longer have to put a stamp on their vote in order to vote. And Patrick Green appears to be very interested in this August and in September that make those return ballots postage free. And last night he asked Sonia, officially asked her to come up with a budget for that and present that to city council within the next few weeks. I think that would be great, especially, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm too scared to go to a polling place come uh, August and November of this year. Also, having sat in the abs absentee room, I can tell you that there are issues. There are a lot of people who still only put one stamp on a ballot, and those are returned to sender. And people don't realize. I have, I've seen people who put two ballots in one envelope. And can't, one of those ballots gets thrown away because... There's no signature on the outside. So it would save, it would greatly increase everyone's concern about COVID-19. Uh, if we could go to a, a postage-free return ballots. Um, our, our budget is $300 million. And she says, well, it might cost 60000 What's 60000 when we're talking about $300 million? So yes. she is coming back to see city council in the so I would like to ask you and the other two state representatives to support city council in that effort and I'd ask also the other Warren residents to contact your your city council representative and explain to him and especially in the middle of this yes. pandemic that we really need to have postage stamp return that will be it will be voted on and decided in the next two weeks yeah. so this is a very short time that's ago. excellent so Michigan is ahead of the curve because of Prop 3, um, Prop 2 and Prop 3, we have no reason absentee voting. Um, you know, everyone should have the access to flexibility of schedule, the ability to research candidates and ballot initiatives. Uh, these are fantastic, not, not to mention work around health issues. So um, we already see it across the country, city clerks that are having not enough poll workers 
because a lot of our poll workers are seniors and retirees and um, getting them, they don't want to expose them exposure. Uh, and then if you see just in Warren alone, we're moving a significant amount of our voters from day of voters to absentee voters or vote from home. And so the city should start looking at, you know, polling locations. Uh, if, if we're over half voting via mail, then we're going to have to uh, put more people counting in AV rooms and uh, we'll need fewer bodies at the polls. And, you know, those day of salaries could help offset some of that uh, funding. In addition, with um, Congress is looking at doing another CARE Act, including in that um, help offset the cost of these mail-in votes. So for health care, for expediency, and just for the good of the system, people have been concerned about the um, integrity of the system, but Michigan uh, Secretary of State has a tracking system. So from the point where you request an AV ballot um, to the point you return it, they scan it and you can go on their website and check where your ballot is in the process. So you know that there's integrity there. Um, so yes, I would very much support a mail-in voting. I think I agree that nobody should be in dis disenfranchised from their vote because they put not enough postage unknowingly. Um, in other states, I believe state of Washington and some places in California, they have dedicated mailboxes kind of like you have, you know, your um, library returns or, you know, if you, if you uh, drop off your water bills and your taxes right there at City Hall that you don't even need postage. You go by, you drop it in, and then the city clerk would then come and retrieve those. Uh, and they found that that's been very successful there and it eliminates that postage. Uh, but I think, you know, let's get a budget. Let's, let's see if we can make that happen. I agree, if we should reduce as many barriers to accessing voting as possible. And so the other piece was, if you can uh, write a letter, email to our congressional candidates uh, representation and ask them that in the next CARE Act that they include that as part of the funding to reimburse the state because the city is doing their budget process and the state is doing our budget process. But we already know that you know um, income tax, um, uh, purchase tax, fuel tax are all down. So uh, myself and the other legislators are anxious. Friday is our, um, every, every six months they do budget projections. So we're going to get a eye-opening projection of what uh, our state is going to be losing out in our budget. And then we're going to have to make some tough choices as to what gets cut back, what gets held off on. Um, and then we have things that we have to fund like education, like health care, like um, corrections that um, we, we have to have in the budget. So what, what, what does that look like? So the other thing we can ask from our congressional delegation is that uh, the state of Michigan gets uh, some additional funds to offset what we're losing in taxes for the year. I got a quick question for you, Lori. Go for uh, it, George. About the, about the budget, <clears throat> only because some things I've been hearing, uh, particularly, you know, near and dear to both of our hearts with education and K-12, um, several of my former colleagues um, that are superintendents, they've been getting regular advisements from MDE mm -hmm. uh, about the possibility, not the, po the probability of cuts to the per pupil foundation allowance. I guess my question is, on the low end, they're hearing between possibly $400 per pupil to an excess of $1,200. Um, on the, if the highest end were to take effect, you and I both know how devastating that would be to public schools, particularly at a time if they're trying to bring students back into the education space, even if it's done in a hybrid model. What have you been hearing from MDE from the legislative side as to what kind of plans they may be having, number one, from a budgetary constraint standpoint, and I know things are just being projected right now, but two, 
their thoughts on what is school going to be looking like come the fall? That is a great question. So that's one piece of if we can get some federal assistance helping to shore up our state budget, that means fewer cuts to um, local city budgets and per pupil funding for schools. I mean, those are some of the very essential functions of our government that we need to make sure are funded. Um, yeah, we have our, and you know, in the initial CARES bills from the federal government, they did a good job of helping up front some of the costs for schools in order to, you know, continue feeding students who would receive free or reduced lunches to help schools um, offset the costs of remote learning, as well as to help get, you know, technology and different things into the hands of students. Um, so it's very important that we get some additional assistance from the federal level to help shore us up in the short term. There has been no speculation as to what per pupil funding cuts would look like. Um, I think that that causes to education because yeah. we, we're just caught up to where we were 10 years ago. I don't want to see us go back. We, we can't afford to. No. Um, as far as what school is going to look like in the fall. So, you know, there's lots of speculation. We know what is our health, you know, advisories are recommending as far as social distancing. Before this even took place. There was some discussion in uh, education committee from our Republican leadership about, you know, is it a hybrid? Are we doing certain kids on Mondays, Tuesday, Wednesdays, or Thursday, Friday, or every even days, odd days, um, you know, cut the classroom size in half while broadcasting lessons home for the other half. Things are going to get really creative. Um, and I said, it, again, it's hard to um, speculate, right? So, you know, we can have these very elaborate ideas and it's good to have things to draw from. And we'll, I will take input from any educational professional who has it. Uh, but again, in two months, our transmission numbers could look very different. What we could have a rebound in a second wave and we're trying to put out fires again or we have it under control and we're looking at kind of like the business plan. Um, you know, are we screening every day as kids are walking in and doing forehead temperatures? Um, are we doing, uh, are we, you know, some people were talking about, do we go to buildings that are open, open rooms and bring in more teachers, which in itself is going to be a challenge when our talent pool is, we're struggling to get people in. Um, how much is online versus in person? So we know right now we're trying to utilize online to make the best of a bad situation, but we also know as educational professionals that that is not optimum learning. That kid relationships with kids and having that contact and that interpersonal relationship uh, is essential to understanding where they are, what they're bringing, what they're struggling with, and meeting those individual needs. So I, I plan on doing some teacher roundtables. I continue to work with superintendents in the area as well as the intermediate school district to kind of get a lot of perspectives. Um, and one thing I'm talking about is for everything uh, like accommodation or modification, we need to put a price tag on it. And we need to have really honest conversations. Education is not a negotiable. Um, for for the kids, but also for the talent pipelines, for businesses, uh, and for investment in Michigan. For me, education, we, we have to be really upfront and about investing in our kids. You know, agree. It is going to be very interesting, whatever education looks like come this fall. But you are right. I think if nothing else, <clears throat> I hope if nothing else, one of the things we learned um, from this crisis is 
just how important that human connection is for kids. It really is. But you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how this changes attitudes and value of education. Um, exactly. I've never heard so much appreciation from parents of what teachers do. Um, you know, with, with what we do with 32 versus having two, three, four at home. Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Certainly. What else do we have? Are we frozen? Nope, people are still here. Okay, I'll throw in a question. Okay. Um, I need vaccines, two of them. Okay. And uh, I called the county health department and the county health department is closed. They're not doing vaccines right now. Then I saw an article in yesterday's paper saying that the healthcare professionals are very concerned about a measles outbreak. And wouldn't that be wonderful in the middle of the pandemic? Uh, because the kids, because the health departments are closed, the doctor's offices are closed, kids aren't getting their vaccine. My doctor has recommended, is recommending that anyone over 60 get a pneumonia vaccine, because if we have a pneumonia vaccine, um, that will help us stave off uh, COVID-19 in the event we get it. So I would like to get one. But uh, this is not a good thing. And I don't know if, if, if they're going to reopen, when they're going to reopen, and if they need additional funding from the county. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there as a major concern of mine. And in the event you're talking to our county people, uh, mm -hmm. what is their plan? How are, because you have to imagine a lot of people, a lot of children have missed vaccines in the, the last few months. I have, uh, my own doctors uh, said that while the doctor's offices were closed to every other service, the one thing they did was vaccines in person, especially for infants, young ones. Um, so I don't know what that age that open, they, they would book in-person appointments for vaccinations. Keep mm -hmm. our well kids healthy. Um, I will look into county health departments and what kind of guidelines they're getting for opening. Um, another thing to explore is a lot of times our um, uh, pharmacies and like minute clinics have are are available for vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So that would be one thing to explore. Right. Well, my doctor will not give me a pneumonia vaccine because he said the current uh, Medicare reimbursement is less than half of the cost. That is definitely so, one of the challenges. I'm on the health policy committee at the state is uh, making sure that our Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates are making it incentive incentivized to perform these routine, you know, functions. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to throw out, I have one more advertisement, which is um, we know that auto insurance is changing. I'm uh, doubling up with State Representative Padma Kupa of Troy and Clawson to do, um, we're inviting the Department of uh, Insurance and Financial Services to do an online town hall um, on changes to the auto insurance. July 1st is when it goes to, into effect. Um, people are gonna be asked to make a lot of choices about coverage and um, cost. And it's very Im important that you're informed about, you know, what trade-offs you're making for cost um, to, sa and to sacrifice coverage. Uh, so that the department will be there. We'll have a representative there who um, will speak to these changes. I did a one back in November, but this is much more of what is being implemented based on the policies. Uh, some advice I got was um, reach out to your agent. Don't wait till your renewal. Give yourself plenty of time to think through what you want and make sure you're getting coverage that you need for your assets. Um, and finally, pull your last two um, uh, insurance renewals. So you have a breakdown of you know what your PIP costs were, 
personal injury protection costs. Um, the, the legislation that was passed gives statewide averages, but you are a consumer and you better believe when I call my insurance agent, I'm going to say, this is what my PIP was. You have to provide 90% uh, average, um, oh, 10 percent savings. So statewide, I'm, that's what I'm looking for. When I shop my insurance around, this is what it cost me before. And, um, and for me personally, giving up on comprehensive coverage is not a negotiable. Um, accidents happen. We, we don't get to choose them. We don't and just right before things happen that Friday the 13th in March, I got hit. I, you know, someone made, they weren't paying attention and they hit my vehicle. Luckily we both walked away. I have thousands of dollars in repairs that needed to take place, but I could do that understanding that I had coverage and, you know, I pay into it every year. And when it happens, I want it there for, to protect me. So these are things that you really need to look carefully at. So that was um, Monday, June 1st, and I believe it will be at noon. I will post a Facebook post and I will be promoting it uh, within the next you know, week or so. So there's lots of going on virtually. And um, I really enjoyed being able to see people and answer questions. It's a little friendlier from my end to, uh, than just uh, talking into space. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me on video. Lori, can I just say one thing, please? Yes, jump on in, Kathy. You're, I've been talking to Dawn at your office, who's great, about my unemployment since April 13th. I'm not getting, it's, it's just done. I talked to your office. But discovered again, I'm just nowhere. I've sent your office like four emails this week. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, it, what do I do? I'm going to lose money if I go back to work without talking to them because we yeah. are waived. No, I appreciate it, Kathy. And I hear your frustration. We, so after two weeks, if we, if you have not heard from them and we have not heard from them, we are hounding them. Um, we have a list of priorities, prioritized cases. Your is, yours is on them. Um, we still haven't gotten a good answer from them as to what, where you are pending and why it hasn't been resolved, but we are continuing to do that. Um, even if you return to work, you are still eligible for the back pay that you were eligible for. Right, it's hard. but that's the way weeks. The, the way weeks is my concern. You cannot get your weeks on ways without talking to them. I'm sorry? I said, I appreciate that too. I, there's nothing I can say because there's no good reason. The, the hardest part is saying, you know, 1.3 million, but when you're that last 200,000 out of 1.3 million, it doesn't help. All right. Well, respectfully, you're saying you're hounding them though. And I don't know. We're I on daily. Just stop responding. So that's where we're at. I'll continue to follow up, Kathy. I'll keep you updated. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other updates for the good of the people or questions? Well, well thank you so much for doing all that. I, I didn't really totally follow the car insurance thing, but I, I got that I should review my policy with my insurance agent. Before July 1st. So the, the, the policy goes into place July 1st. Um, you don't want to be there July 1st making a, a pressure choice. Right. Really talk to your agent, find out what your options are, and make the choice that's best for you. And for the, for the coverage I have now, they should give me a 10% reduction. Is that right? So that's the tricky part. So as it was sold to voters across Michigan, 
It is a 10% average discount statewide. Huh. So it was a very interesting play on words uh -huh. because what people want is a guarantee. If I give up, you know, my comprehensive coverage, I'm going to get 20% discount. Like I should be able to plug it into a formula. The, the language that was pushed through by the majority was uh, average statewide. Well, it's cheaper to give someone who has a $400 policy a 10% discount of $40 than someone who has a $5,000 or $8,000 policy that they have to give an $800 discount. Right. So DIFFS is working very carefully to monitor how they're implementing it, but um, it, it's, it's a negotiating tactic that you can take to your agent and say, you know, this is how much I should be getting, this is how much I paid, and this is how much I want my policy. Can you do it? Okay. And I think DIFFS might be able to speak it to it in more detail, Hale. So making sure J June 1st is on your calendar, that town hall, right. they'll, they can answer much more of these questions in detail. What time would that be? I believe it's noon, Monday, June 1st. And I'll find that on your page? It will be. It has not been created as an event yet, but it's coming up. Okay. Well, great. Well, I'm signing off now. It was very nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Take care.